My name is Daniel Shane. I'm a professor at Rutgers University in New Jersey. And today we will be talking about rotifers and their ability to survive freezing. Uh, rotifers are animals. Um, they're microscopic and they are found pretty much wherever you find water. Um, they're part of zooplankton um, and they feed on uh, microbial uh, single cell organisms like algae, bacteria, and fungus. Uh, that's sort of the, the overview. They have quite a few interesting properties. For example, uh, many of them are, are um, only females and they survive in extreme environments. And this is interesting because they don't reproduce sexually, which, which is considered um, sort of a requirement for adaptation. So we have you know, an asexual uh, organism that has evolved to occupy, you know, very different types of habitats, um, like glaciers, for example, and hot springs. Most of uh, that work was done by the, the Russian group they have a coring device so they could dig down into arctic permafrost and extract a core then they were able to uh, cut that up into sections and allow the ice to thaw and then observe if anything was alive anything started moving and the the material could be dated by you know standard um, carbon dating. By dating the material that was found in in connection with this living rotifer that sort of came back to life, they were able to date it, you know, with with uh, you know, a fair amount of confidence. The thawing, there's there's nothing too complicated about thawing. So I've done similar experiments uh, with other rotifers, and it's well, the volumes are fairly small, so it only takes a few minutes for the ice to thaw. The rotifers, you know, will be lethargic at first. And after a few days, uh, they start moving around normally. So it's just a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a wait, it's a waiting game. Put this little slice into it into a dish, and you just wait to see if anything starts moving. Yeah, I guess if I knew. The answer to that question, you know, I might be considered a candidate for a Nobel Prize. Um, yeah, so this is this is a central question, and sort of a general answer is that the the problem is when you freeze something, you form crystals, ice crystals, and and this is a big problem because the ice crystals basically tear up the cell when they form and when they thaw. It's just the shearing of all the tissue. So you have to find some way to, to shield, sort of mask the components of the cell from these ice crystals. And there are different ways that people think this happened. One is there's specialized proteins that can bind to the ice and stop them from growing crystals. And another idea is that other different proteins shield 
um, the cell, sort of, you know, a sci-fi type of analogy is like a like a spatial, like in Star Wars, where you, you know, you you generate this this shield that protects you from, you know, incoming fire, uh, gun or firepower, lasers, whatever. And so you're creating some type of shield. And then the other idea is that you introduce molecules like sugars that disrupt the formation of ice. And so there's evidence for all, all of these different mechanisms. Um, but it's not clear how these rotifers are doing it. Um, there are some other examples um, of similar microscopic organisms, like a nematode. There's a little roundworm, and they've been found frozen for you know similar you know tens of thousands of years and brought back to life. And also tardigrades, they're kind of popular these days. You can freeze them and bombard them with radiation, this and that. Um, so there are other examples of multicellular organisms that survive freezing. Um, you know, people, people starting from Walt Disney have, you know, been interested in trying to freeze human. And now there are even companies that, uh, offer freezing services. So if you have a terminal illness, you can get frozen and, uh, you know, hope that in a couple hundred years we figure out how to bring humans back to life. So Disney tried this, but apparently, you know, the way he was prepared pretty much excludes the possibility that he can get brought back to life. Uh, the, the modern companies, they're much more sophisticated. Um, the challenge is pretty much the same. You have to prevent these crystals from forming. And what happens if you have a big enough mass, like you can, you can freeze the outside cells, but the inside cells take a really long time to freeze. And that, um, allows enough time for crystals to grow. So what, so what people are doing is trying to, like, infuse the coolant from the inside and also freeze from the outside. So you have a sort of consistent freezing and rapid freezing. Right? And also introduce these other protectants, these cryoprotectants, like sugars in particular that disrupt the ice crystal organization. It's a big, you know, it's kind of, it's turning into a pretty big industry. And let, I'll just add here that we've been able to, to freeze human cells for a very long time. It's not a problem. We just, they have to be isolated from each other. And if you add the right ingredients, the cryoprotectants that I'm talking about, like sugars, you can also add glycerol um, and some other things, and then freeze at the right speed, then, you know, we, we store human cells all the time for many years, years and years and years, decades, individual cells. It gets more complicated when you put the cells together. So if I'm trying to freeze your liver, for example, that's much harder than trying to freeze an individual liver cell. But this is the, the, the direction that, that the field is going and the observation that you know, a whole animal, or in this case a rotifer, 
was able to f- survive freezing for you know tens of thousands of years uh, gives us hope that you know, we'll be able to do something similar with more complicated animals like humans. The big question really is, you know, what is the mechanism that these rotifers in particular are using to survive these extended time periods frozen? Uh, so we, we don't know the answer to that question. In science, um, really the best approach is trying to understand what's going on. And then uh, that gives you the power, you know, the knowledge to be able to, you know, apply this technology. Um, basic science to explore, explore the unknown. Uh, so that this would be the next step for the, the rotifers to try to understand you know, whether there's particular proteins. I'm pretty sure that a group, and I can't remember where they're from, but they have identified some type of masking protein, um, possibly in tardigrades, that seems to protect cell components from cold temperature. 